Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. Today is the 19th lecture. This 19th lecture basically is on China's geopolitics. And within that, we are going to discuss the geo strategy of China. Now, uh, the Geopolitics, I had discussed this previously when I discussed India-China relations. Geopolitics is an, a, a kind of an intersection between three factors, history, geography and ideology. So when we discuss geopolitics, we have to take into account these three elements. History means how things evolved from the past to present. Geography means the geographical features that, that influence the positions of various countries in a particular location. And then ideological factors, what, what are the leaders thinking, what are the political forces in, in action. So these three things taken together determine the geopolitical situation. Now part of geopolitics is geostrategy, geostrategy means take into, into account all the, these factors that I mentioned, what is the strategy that has been adopted by a particular country. So that strategy is known as geo strategy. So for China, there are three important uh, components of a geo strategy. These are not exclusively three, there are others also, but I, I would like to discuss three because it is, there isn't enough time to discuss each and every one of them. So these three are number one, Trans-Himalayan strategy. So across, across the Himalayas, what, what does China want to achieve and how it wants to achieve it. Then there is the string of pearls. So this is uh, in the Indian Ocean region. What is China's goal in the Indian Ocean region? That is called the string of pearls strategy. And then there is a, the grander one that is the Belt and Road Initiative which connects all the various strategies that China has in, in various parts of, of its neighborhood, uh, Eurasia and then Indian Ocean, South China Sea, everything taken together is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, the idea of Xi Jinping. So this particular le lecture is titled Trans-Himalayan Strategy, String of Pearls and Belt and Road Initiative. So this is uh, China and the Tibetan Plateau. So we'll start with the Trans-Himalayan strategy and the most important or the pivot to the Trans-Himalayan strategy is, is Tibet. Now the question is what does China want? And this is reflected in this particular statement given by Mao Zedong. Now Mao Zedong, it was uh, in somewhere in the 1950s, although he, he, had, he had mentioned something similar in the 1940s. But it is not part of any official records of uh, China. These are all uh, uh, reported by various scholars. So Mao had said that Tibet is China's right hand palm. So this is the right hand, this is the palm of the right hand. So Tibet is the right hand palm, which is detached from his five fingers. So there are five fingers in the palm. So these five fingers are detached from China and these five fingers are Ladakh. Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan and Nepal, Northeast Frontier Agency which is today Arunachal Pradesh. So these are the five fingers which are detached from China by whom? By India. All as all of these five are either occupied by or under the influence of India, it is China's responsibility to liberate the five to be rejoined with Tibet. So actually the goal of China is to take away these areas from Indian influence and then attach with it with Tibet and occupy them basically because Tibet is occupied by China. So these also 
would be occupied by China. So the China wants to extend its occupation from Tibet into the Himalayas. And this was the time when India was following the Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai diplomacy led by Pandit Nehru. So, uh, so behind the back, China was planning occupation of the Himalayas. Uh, now uh, in, in Chinese, this is called Si Chang the Wu Chi. Si Chang is the Chinese name for Tibet. Si means, si means West. Chang is Tibet. So Western Tibet. So this is Western Tibet or Outer Tibet which is uh, today Tibet autonomous region which was uh, basically defined in the in the Shimla convention of 1914. Uh, so this is outer Tibet and then or, or, or say uh, Si Chang means uh, western Tibet and then there is eastern Tibet that is Amdo. So this is Amdo and this is Kham. Some part of Kham is there in, in, in uh, Tibet autonomous region, but rest of Kham, the uh, the eastern part of Kham, has been annexed by China in, in into other provinces, and Amdo is within the the Qinghai province of China. Okay, so although although they are they have some kind of a Tibetan autonomous uh, a local local uh, some kind of a government there, but they are not part of Tibet proper. So Si Chang the Wu means five Wu Wu means five five fingers. So Tibet's five fingers. Now why Tibet is important? Tibet is important because you can see in this map. If you look at this map carefully, Tibet is often called the third pole. There is North Pole, there is South Pole, and then there is Tibet, because Tibet is has lot of glaciers and many important rivers flow from Tibet. As you can see this is Mount Kailash, near Kailash is the Mansarovar lake and then from this lake four important rivers flow into India. There is the Indus or the Sindhu river which from India then goes into Pakistan. Then there is the Satlaj river which is a very important river in Punjab. Then there is the Karnali river which is known as Ghagra in India. It, it goes and meets the Ganga. And then there is the Yarlung Sangpo, which becomes the Brahmaputra. So the Brahmaputra river, which is uh, the important river in Assam, huge river. So one who controls Mount Kailash and the Mansarovar lake controls the origin of these rivers. Therefore, and, being, and, and Mount Kailash being part of Tibet, uh, it is under Chinese control. Then there are important Chinese rivers like the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. So they also flow from Tibet, but the eastern part of Tibet from Amdo. And therefore, China has separated Amdo from the rest of Tibet and created a different province which is directly and it is not autonomous. It is directly administered by the central government. Okay, because they don't want to give Tibetans any, even the minimal control because Tibet autonomous region itself is minimally controlled by the Tibetans. Nominally, there is the governor who is, who is a Tibetan, but the party sec secretary is a Han Chinese. Even that is not acceptable because Amdo is the place of origin of these two important rivers of China, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, the rivers that are the basis of Chinese civilization. Then there are rivers flowing into uh, Southeast Asia like the Irrawaddy River of Myanmar or the Mekong River flowing into Indochina. So origin of all these rivers is Tibet and therefore Tibet is such an important region geopolitically and therefore the Chinese occupation of Tibet in 1950-1951 is such an important event and India missed it completely. India did not recognize the importance of Tibet in the early 1950s. And they relied on the assurances given by China that there will be uh, friendship between India and China. And that was a big mistake. Anyhow, so this is Tibet. Tibet and, and then related to Tibet are the five fingers. Now, uh, let me go briefly into some history of Tibet. So this is a famous mantra of Tibetan Buddhism 
Om Mani Padme Hum. So this is chanted by the Tibetan Buddhists. And this is the flag of Tibetan independence. Basically the central Tibetan administration of the government in exile, it, 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 it is its flag. And then there are two important personalities who, who uh, basically are the leaders of the Tibetans. There is the Dalai Lama. This is the 14th Dalai Lama. This is a photo taken in Beijing in 1954. So this is the 14th Dalai Lama. Dalai Lamas incarnate. So once one Dalai Lama dies, he is supposed to incarnate into another body and that young child is then uh, found out by the other Lama, discovered by other Lamas based on certain uh, scriptures and certain instructions given by the previous Dalai Lama and then that child is then installed as the new Dalai Lama. Okay, So this is the 14th Dalai Lama and then uh, this used to be the 10th Pancham Lama. Pancham Lama is you can say number 2. So this is the 10th Pancham Lama. Now the Chinese exploited the rivalry between the two Lamas. The Pancham Lama became pro-Chinese. He was in fact a supporter of the Kuomintang. But in 1949, he changed his allegiance to the communist. When the communist emerged victorious in the civil war, he changed sides and joined the communist. And he helped the communist in the invasion of Tibet and which they will call the liberation of Tibet. Based on certain conditions that the Chinese won't interfere in the, in the religious life and, and the internal administration of Tibet. On the other hand, Dalai Lama was always wary of Chinese involvement. He wanted to, to side with India and, and, and the West to, to, to preserve the independence, the de facto independence of Tibet. So there was a difference in the policy of Pancham Lama and the Dalai Lama and there was a rivalry between them. But in the mid 50s, after, after the 17 points had been signed and Tibet had become a part of, of the People's Republic of China, there was a brief period when uh, they went along and and uh, and and uh, try to cooperate with the People's Republic of China. Okay, this is uh, some other photos like uh, meeting Mao, and then this is uh, 1956 when uh, Dalai Lama and Pancham Lama both visited India. This is uh, they with uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. 1956. Now, if you go briefly into the history. Uh, Tibet became a part of China when the Manchus, they conquered uh, Tibet in 1720. Uh, before that, Tibet was not under the Ming, Ming dynasty that ruled China. Tibet was controlled by uh, Mongols and some indigenous uh, Tibetan dynasties and then there was the institution of the Dalai Lama. So there was no clear say ruler of Tibet and Dalai Lama had emerged as a very important leader in this period. But then the Manchus who were also Buddhists and followers of Tibetan Buddhism, they conquered Tibet and they accepted Tibet as, as their spiritual guide. So Dalai Lama was accepted as a spiritual guide of the Chinese emperor, but politically Tibet would remain under China. So this was a kind of a guru-shishya relationship. Tibet was the guru and China was the shishya where guru would look after the spiritual needs of the entire body politic while the political needs and the military needs would be fulfilled by China. So this was the arrangement between the two. Then the British of course because of the great game they intervened and there was the young husband expedition to Tibet through which British got certain rights in Tibet. They, they established certain military positions in Tibet in order to prevent any foreign powers from interfering like the Russian Empire. And this was then finalized in the 1914 Shimla Convention when the boundary between India and Tibet was decided, the McMahon line was drawn. Plus uh, in India also received certain extraterritorial rights in, in Tibet, I mean British India in, in, in Tibet uh, and, 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 and the guarantee given by the British that they will protect the the autonomy of Tibet from Chinese interference, the interference of the central government of China. So that was the Shimla convention. The 14th Dalai Lama was discovered and enthroned in 1940 at the age of 4 years and 6 months, about that time approximately. 
Now he is known as the reincarnation of a deity known as Avalokiteshwara. Okay, so Avalokiteshwara is a bodhisattva who reincarnates in the form of the Dalai Lama in order to spread mercy in the world, in order to help the ordinary people to achieve higher status in heaven, so they can reach higher heavens and ultimately achieve nirvana. So although he is, he is liberated, Avalokiteshwara is liberated, but he does not take, uh, take liberation, he does not accept nirvana because he wants to help the ordinary people. Similarly, the Panchan Lama is known as the reincarnation of Amitava. Amitava is another or Amitav we will say in Hindi. Amitav is also another Bodhisattva who also, who actually created a heaven. So there is a pure land Buddhism uh, sect. So the pure land heaven was created by Amitava so that uh, ordinary people could go and enjoy in this heaven for many years. So the 10th Pancham Lama was, sell, uh, was enthroned in 1949 and then he joined the communist in the invasion of Tibet. Now when Dalai Lama and Pancham Lama were visiting India, there was a revolt by the Khampa. Khampa are the people of Kham. They revolted because of the land reforms introduced by the Communist Party. So the Communist Party was changing the property relations in, 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 in the Kham area. And so the Kham warriors, they revolted against uh, the Chinese, but it was crushed. At that time, Dalai Lama had asked Pandit Nehru for asylum. He said that he is ready to side with uh, India and the West in order to, to liberate Tibet from, from China. But Pandit Nehru refused because he was having uh, very good relations with China and he advised Dalai Lama to cooperate with the Chinese. But that, that thing did not work very well and by 1959 Nehru had realized that Chinese, Chinese after occupying Tibet were now eyeing Indian territory in Aksai Chin and, in, and across the McMohan line in, in Nefa. And so uh, India began to support the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama, uh, because there was an uprising by the Tibetans in 1959, Dalai Lama escaped to India and in India with the support of Nehru, he formed the government in exile or the central Tibetan administration. While the Pancham Lama remained in, 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 in China and he supported uh, China. So Dalai Lama went over to India, he went against China while Pancham Lama was pro-China. But, but in the great leap forward, more and more uh, reforms, land reforms were introduced in Tibet, even in Tibetan autonomous region reforms were introduced and that led to a disaster, the great leap forward was a big disaster with uh, 30 to 45 million people dying and Tibet also a large number of people died because of these policies. And Pancham Lama, when he, when, he, when he noticed this disaster, he wrote an essay criticizing the Chinese policies in Tibet in 1962. But the Chinese did not take it kindly, although Cho Enlai initially showed interest, but then Mao said that Pancham Lama was a traitor. And in 1964, he was declared the traitor of the Tibetan people for criticizing the Chinese. And he was arrested. In the Cultural Revolution from 1966 onwards, the Pancham Lama was further persecuted. He was interrogated, beaten up, so on and so forth. So basically, this was a betrayal of the Tibetan people and the Tibetan Lamas by the Chinese. Once Mao died, situation began to cool down and Pancham Lama by that time I think had been uh, practically, uh, he, he was forced to uh, to get married. So in 1979, he got married to a Chinese girl. A Lama is supposed to be a sannyasi, a person who does not marry. But Pancham Lama, to uh, show his support for the communist ideals, he married a Chinese girl. And in fact, her daughter was born to him in 1983. She was named as Princess of Tibet. This is a Chinese way of tightening their hold over Tibet by, by integrating the whole Pancham Lama institution into the, into the Chinese society. Then uh, in, the Tibetans still won't accept because Tibetans were very religious people and they had faith in their Lamas. 
And so there was in 87, from 87 to 89, another unrest in Tibet. And at that time, Hu, Hu Chintao was the, was the party secretary in Tibet, in charge of uh, policy making there. And he persecuted the Tibetans. Large number of Tibetans were killed. And in fact, the 10th Pancham Lama died under suspicious conditions. So many Tibetans believe that he was poisoned by the Chinese state, specifically by Hu Chintao, at the orders of Hu Chintao, of course. So he died. And uh, so since the 10th Pancham Lama died, the 11th had to be found. And so the Tibetans followed the traditional process. And uh, the Dalai Lama recognized the 11 Pancham Lama. So 11 Pancham Lama was found in Tibet and uh, he received the recognition of Dalai Lama on 14th of May. Uh, Chinese government wanted to be consulted, but bef before the Chinese government could intervene, Dalai Lama quickly gave his approval to the 11 Pancham Lama. But because he was in Tibet, within a few days, the Chinese government abducted the 11 Pancham Lama. He disappeared along with his family and no one knows where that I think he was age was a few years, uh, so 1995, so six years old. The six year old child disappeared. And instead of him, China nominated their own Pancham Lama. So this is the 11 Pancham Lama who is approved by the Chinese government. So he was installed. He was a young boy, a young child at that time. So this is a recent photograph. So he is basically the Tibetan face of the Chinese. He, he is the vice chairman of the uh, World Buddhist Association, which is supported by the Chinese government. But the Tibetans still worship the Dalai Lama. And uh, in 2008, there was a Tibetan unrest, which of course, again, was crushed by the Communist Party. After that, Tibetans have felt a lot of, a lot of helplessness. And many monks and nuns, beginning 2009, has started self-immolation. So they go out in public with the help of, uh, because with the smartphone now you can take the videos. And so they would self-immolate, they would burn themselves alive as a form of protest and helplessness against the oppression of the Chinese state. Okay, but by Chinese state is very brutal. These techniques don't work with them. The central Tibetan administration and the Dalai Lama is very popular in the West. And it is also a member of the unrepresented nations and people organization at the Hague. So it, it became a founding member in 1991. Dalai Lama is very popular all over the world. He was, he is a Nobel laureate. He lives in India in Dharamshala, which is his headquarters, a beautiful place with a lot of monasteries. So, so Tibet is completely in the grip of the Chinese government. And from Tibet, it is extending its grip, its grip towards other areas. So, Ladakh. Ladakh is a union territory in India. It's an integral part of India. This is the earlier Ladakh was part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, state of Jammu and Kashmir. But now it has been the state of Jammu and Kashmir has been bifurcated into two union territories: union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and union territory of Ladakh. The eastern part of Ladakh is under Chinese occupation. This is known as Aksai Chin. Now, Ladakh used to have its own king. It was an independent kingdom till 1834. And then the Dogra kings of Jammu, they defeated the Ladakhi king and annexed Ladakh to their own kingdom. And, and the Dogra kingdom was a vassal state of the Sikh empire. So, Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the emperor of the Sikh em empire and Maharaja uh, Gulab Singh was the Dogra king under the Sikh empire. So, Basically, Ladakh also became part of the Sikh Empire. In response, the Chinese invaded Ladakh. So, the famous uh, uh, Dogra general, Zorawar Singh, he had actually conquered Ladakh and then he went into Tibet. But the Tibetan expedition was not very successful because of the tough climate and he had to, his army had to withdraw. And then the Chinese, with the help of the Tibetans together, they invaded Ladakh. But they were defeated by the Sikh Dogra army. The Sikhs were uh, then defeated by the British and uh, the Sikh empire then collapsed and Jammu and Kashmir became a separate princely state under Maharaja Gulab Singh. 
So this uh, this state of Jammu and Kashmir was formed in 1846. So this is the called the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Used to be called the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, and it was ruled by the Dogras from 1846 to 1947. Uh, then in 1947-48, there was the Indo-Pakistan War. Pakistan invaded the state of Jammu and Kashmir and occupied parts of it and parts of Ladakh also that is uh, the northern territories or Gilgit, Baltistan. Now the Chinese also had claims over Tibet, Ladakh as I had mentioned that the Chinese considered it one of the fingers of Tibet and so they occupied Aksai Chin and built a road connecting their province of Tibet with, with uh, Xinjiang. So Xinjiang and Tibet were connected by a road built by the Chinese and the older roads like for example Ladakh, Xinjiang road or the Ladakh, Tibet road were closed down by the Chinese, especially after the 1962 war when they uh, completely occupied Aksai Chin and, and, and uh, closed down all interaction between Ladakh and Xinjiang and Ladakh and Tibet. They also signed uh, an, a border agreement with Pakistan and took over the Shakshgam Valley, okay, which, which again is Indian territory, illegally occupied by Pakistan and then handed over to, illegally handed over to China. It was also the, the, the important place for the Ind India-Pakistan war or the Kargil war of 1999. And then it was also a place where the Galwan, the recent Galwan uh, standoff happened between India and China. In, when I discuss the India-China relations, I have already discussed the Galwan conflict in detail. So I will not go into the details of it. So these are some of the activities that are happening in Ladakh. But Ladakh is firmly, except for the Aksai chain, firmly under the control of India. The people of Ladakh consider themselves to be Indian citizens. It sends elected representatives to the Lok Sabha. And, uh, and uh, India is committed to liberate rest of Ladakh, whether it's Gilgit, Baltistan or Aksai Chin from Pakistan and China respectively. So this is the status of Ladakh. Then we have the other three fingers, second, third and fourth finger, Nepal. So this is the sovereign nation of Nepal. Nepal is a sovereign state, an independent state. Then Sikkim, Sikkim is an Indian state. Okay, Sikkim belongs to India, it is a undisputed Indian territory and then Bhutan, Bhutan is another sovereign state. So these are fingers number 2, 3 and 4 according to the Chinese understanding. Now the kingdom of Nepal was established in 1768 by Maharaj Prithvi Narayan Shah and Nepal attacked Tibet twice because the Gorkhas were a martial race and they wanted to expand their empire, build a great empire. They already uh, defeated all the neighboring king kingdoms to, uh, to, to build a, a, a great empire extending from uh, Kumao and Garhwal, in fact up to the Kangla fort in, in, in him, today's Himachal to Sikkim. And then they wanted to expand towards the south which was the uh, kingdom of Awadh and towards the north into, into uh, Tibet. But Tibet was, was ruled by China, so it was under Chinese suzerainty, while the, uh, the kingdom of Awadh was under the uh, suzerainty of the, of the East India Company, both much powerful, much more powerful than Nepal. But still, uh, the Gorkhas being a warlike people, they invaded, invaded uh, Tibet. But the Chinese intervened, the Chinese army came, they, they defeated the Gorkhas and they entered into Nepalese territory and the, and the Gorkhas were then able to stop the Chinese and then they signed the treaty of Betravati in 1792 in which Nepal and Tibet both were declared as tributaries of China. So Nepal accepted the tributary status and in return they were, China would intervene in case there is a dispute between Nepal and Tibet and Tibet would respect the right of Nepalese traders or the Gorkha traders in Tibet. Then uh, Nepal was trying to expand into India because Tib uh, Tibet had been blocked because of 
the Chinese intervention. So they decided to expand in, into Indian kingdoms. And the East India Company, who, which believed itself to be a protectorate of a protector of the Indian kingdoms, intervened. And then there was the Anglo Gorkha War, in which again the Gorkhas were defeated, although they fought, fought very bravely. So in 1816, the Treaty of Sugoli was signed, in which Nepal accepted a British resident in Kathmandu. So resident is like an advisor. So the British should advise the Nepalese government in terms of foreign policy, so on and so forth. Plus, Nepal also ceded some territory to the British. The Tarai region was ceded to the British, which British later returned to Nepal in lieu of the service provided by the Gorkha soldiers. So, the Nepalese began to support the British in war. For example, in the 1857 War of Independence, the Gorkhas supported the British. Same in the First World War and the Second World War also, the Gorkhas fought for the British to fight against the Germans and the and in the Second World War, Germans and the Japanese. Now, uh, after the Opium Wars, China had become weak and there were no condition to intervene in Tibet. So, taking advantage of that, the Prime Minister of Nepal, Jang Bahadur Rana, he ordered the invasion of Tibet in 1855-56, which the Gorkhas won. They defeated the Tibetans and they got some uh, money in return from the Tibetans and, and certain privileges in Tibet. So, Nepal always considers itself to be a sovereign nation. It does not like inter interference from other countries, especially India, although civilizationally they are, they, they are the same people. But uh, Nepal al always considers itself to be sovereign because of the history of the wars they have fought to assert their independence. So, uh, Nepal has always been close to India and China has played a, a role of, of an external player. China has not tried to interfere in the domestic politics of Nepal and always supported the existing government of Nepal, whether it was the rule of the, of the, of the king, the Nepal Naresh, or later on when uh, a, a federal republic, democratic republic was established in 2008 and, and, and various forms of communist prime ministers ruled over, over Nepal. And so in that case, they would say, Communist, communists are brothers, China are communists, Nepal's leaders are communists, so we are brothers. And when the king was ruling, it was said, China always supports third world country, so China would support the king of Nepal. While India became very unpopular in Nepal because being very close to Nepal, India has tried to intervene by supporting various players. In fact, in 2008, monarchy was abolished because of the of the advice given by the Indians to the, to the king of Nepal that he should not oppose the abolition of monarchy. Otherwise, the Nepal Nepalese army was very loyal to the king and if he had, if he had ordered, the army would have, would have overthrown the constituent assembly and restored the monarchy. Anyhow, so this is the situation in Nepal. Nepal is a kind of a buffer state between India and China. It tries to play, play off both of them. Chinese interference is increasing. China is very popular because it provides uh, financial aid without interfering in domestic affairs. Well, civilizationally, in terms of religion, it's a Hindu nation. I mean, not officially, but in because more than 80% population are Hindu and then 10 odd percent are Buddhist. So it's very close to India in that sense. But India is a bit unpopular. When Narendra Modi became Prime Minister, he visited Nepal in 20. 15 and, and he received overwhelming support of the people and the leaders of Nepal. In fact, they were shouting uh, Harar Modi and all that. Uh, but once there was this blockade because of the Madeshi issue, uh, India again became unpopular in Nepal. Anyhow, we, we must proceed. Next finger is Sikkim. Now, Sikkim is also a Nepali majority uh, in terms of population, Nepali majority state. It, it's an integral territory of India. In 1974-75, uh, Sikkim became an Indian state. It was integrated with India. Before that, it was a protectorate, just like Bhutan. It has similar status to Bhutan. So the defense and foreign affairs was, was controlled by India, while the internal administration was controlled by the king of Sikkim, the Chogyal. And this arrangement existed since 1890. With, with the Anglo-Chinese convention, with, with the, a treaty between uh, the Chinese and, and, uh, 
and the British which, which basically determined the boundary of Sikkim. Only problem was this, the Chumbi Valley, this is the Chumbi Valley, this, uh, this reverse triangle which is Chinese territory, it's like a dagger in, in, into the Indian territory, okay, between uh, Sikkim and Bhutan. So, this is Bhutan, this is Sikkim and this, this belongs to China because this is uh, Tibet. So, even China recognized Sikkim as part of India in 2003. Okay, so, so Sikkim is very well integrated with India, although uh, China from time to time tries to, uh, you know, play some, uh, some does, does some foul things there by trying to infiltrate into the territory. Near Sikkim, for example, in Doklam, there was this whole situation in 2017. So, this was in Bhutan. So, Bhutan is the, is the fourth finger. It's an independent state. It became a UN member in 1971, even before People's Republic of China. India recognizes independence, unlike in Sikkim. So, Sikkim, because it was a Nepali majority uh, state, uh, the Nepalese people voted overwhelmingly to join the Indian Union. There was a referendum. And so, Sikkim became part of India. But Bhutan, because it was a majority Bhutanese or Tibetan origin people, they have remained independent. There were uh, about uh, one third population was Nepali, but they were denied citizenship and one lakh Nepalese were expelled from Bhutan in, uh, in 1988. Anyhow, that, so these are some of the issues. So Bhutan is very close to India. It still depends on India for advice and, and security. Right recently in 2017, Bhutanese territory was threatened by China and so India intervened and protected Bhutanese territory. So this is the uh, fourth finger and the final fifth finger is Arunachal Pradesh, especially Tawang. So this is Tawang Monastery is located here, and China claims to be this uh, this territory to be part of China. But this is a, a an Indian state. Arunachal Pradesh received uh, statehood in 1987, so it became the 23rd state. Sikkim was the 22nd state. Arunachal Pradesh was the 23rd state. Since 2006, China has been using the term South Tibet to indicate uh, Arunachal Pradesh and any person born in Arunachal Pradesh is given staple visa. So their visa is not stamped on the passport but they put a staple. So this is a Chinese way of interfering in the status of Arunachal Pradesh and the rights of the people of uh, Indian citizens in Arunachal Pradesh. So these are the five fingers. So this is the status. Tibet is occupied by China. It is, it is a Chinese territory now. Ladakh is sovereign Indian territory, Sikkim is sovereign Indian territory and Arunachal Pradesh is sovereign Indian territory while Nepal and Bhutan are sovereign states with close relation with India but China trying to intervene and, and sway them away from Indian influence. Now let us proceed to the next item that is string of pearls. Now China faces something known as the Malacca Dilemma. These are the Malacca Straits, which is between uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, which is a sea lane from which uh, most of China's energy resources go from the, from the Middle East all the way from Malacca Strait, it goes into China. Now, of course, from Russia also there is energy supply, but most of the energy supply comes still comes from the Middle East. Plus, this is the important trade route. But uh, Indian territory of Andaman and Nicobar Islands is near the Malacca Straits. So, in case there is a conflict between India and China, then the Indian Navy can blockade the Malacca Straits so, st and stop the energy supply to China. So, this is known as Malacca Dilemma. How to overcome this Malacca Dilemma? So, in order to overcome this, so, China have adopted a strategy called known as string of pearls. Of course, this, this term is, well, is coined by Western scholars and not by China itself, but it is a very interesting uh, uh, coinage. Now, there are pearls. What are pearls? Pearls are uh, naval bases or ports, deep sea ports developed by China in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. So, these are like pearls. And if you connect these pearls, you will see it, it, it looks like a string. 
this string going all around here. You can see this string. So this is like a string, a, a, a string or a necklace around India. So this is India here. So it goes all around. And if you take the 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 land area also, then this will go all around. So this surrounds India from all sides. But of course, this is an imaginary line. It's it's not so easy because India also has its own uh, capabilities, and so this. Uh, String is not very effective in that sense, but still it is an emerging threat and India, need, India has done a lot to counter it. So what are these pearls? So the pearl starts from Hainan. So Hainan is a province in China, so it is a sovereign Chinese territory. It has a submarine base. If you, if you remember in the last lecture, I, I mentioned the EP3 incident in 2001 when American aircraft had to land in, in, the, in the island. So, uh, so what were they doing? They were basically collecting information about the submarine base that China was building at that time. So it starts there. Then in the Paracel Islands, which is a disputed territory, China has, has occupied Udi Island. So Udi Island is part of the Paracel Islands and China has built a naval base there. So that is the next uh, pearl. And then Udi Island keeps a watch on the Spartley Islands also. So here they do not have a strong naval base, but because they uh, control the Udi Island, they are able to keep a watch or, or assert their influence in, in uh, Spartley Islands also. Then there is a secret naval base in Cambodia known as Riam Base. Okay. Uh, so the Riam Base is a Cambodian naval base, but uh, it is actually controlled by China, although it had been denied publicly, but reports have come out that this is actually controlled by China. So this, 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 this particular base is controlled by China. Then China has been trying to build a canal in the Kra uh, Isthmus. Kra Isthmus is a, is a thin uh, land in, in Thailand that, that divides the South China Sea from the Indian Ocean. And just like the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal, China wants to build an, uh, a man-made canal connecting South China Sea with the Indian Ocean and this will basically remove the Malacca dilemma that then Ch China can use the, that particular canal and Thailand is a friendly, friendly country to China and so it could use that canal to connect itself with the Indian Ocean or Bay of Bengal. But this has not been successful, the Thai government has not really implemented this, uh, this, this plan and so it is just a pipe dream. Instead, what China has done is trying to, China has developed land linkages with Pakistan and connecting it with the Gwadar port in Pakistan. So from China, there, there are pipelines and land routes and railway lines connecting China with Gwadar port which is again a Chinese naval base near the Straits of Hormuz here, which is the important supply lane of energy resources. So this is a way of countering the Malacca dilemma. There is another route from China into Myanmar into Kyakfu port, which again is, is, is uh, being built by the Chinese, developed by the Chinese. Now India has tried to counter these both by investing in the Sitwe port in Myanmar. Both China and, and, and India are investing in this, but because India is investing, so India can keep and watch over this particular area. So it can watch over Myanmar and, and China's uh, development in Myanmar. In fact, there is another island or another uh, collection of islands known as the Coco Islands, which actually used to be part of the British Indian territory, but it was handed over by the British to the Burmese and then after Japanese occupation, this was a kind of a disputed territory, but Pandit Nehru handed this over to the Myanmaris because this used to belong to them uh, before Japanese occupation. But it has become strategic, strategically dangerous for India with Indian, some Indian strategists and policy makers saying that China is in occupation of the Cocoa Islands. Uh, so although this is not confirmed and so whichever is confirmed I have 
I have uh, men, I have uh, I have used the yellow color, and whichever whichever is unconfirmed, it is transparent. Then the Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka is under a 99 year lease of of China because uh, it was built with Chinese assistance, and because Sri Lankan economy has collapsed, so Sri Lanka was not able to repay the loans given by the Chinese, and so. They handed it over to the Chinese for a 99 year lease. This is this is neo colonialism because Hong Kong used to be a 99 year lease from China to Britain, which they considered to be humiliating. But now they are doing the same in Sri Lanka. Besides that, in the Red Sea also, near the Suez Canal, they have in Sudan as well as Djibouti, they are developing certain posts. Now. China has been countered by the Quad. There is, of course, the United States of America, which is everywhere, which has hundreds of bases all over the world. So, both in the uh, West Asia or the Middle East, as well as in in Southeast Asia, United States is the dominant power. So, obviously, it can counter China anytime it it wants. Then Japan and Australia are American allies, so they are also cooperating with the Americans with with the help of their strong navies. Then America is also in the right in the center of the Indian Ocean with Diego Garcia base, which is a British territory, but it's an American base. So from Diego Garcia also America can control what is happening in the Indian Ocean. India also has its um, advantages in the Indian Ocean. Of course, it's an Indian Ocean, so it has listening posts in Madagascar, Seychelles, and Mauritius. Uh, it also has listening post in Oman, and it is also developing a base in 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 Oman. So, with the help of Oman, friendly governments in Oman, Mauritius, um, in in Madagascar and Seychelles, India is trying to develop its own capacity. Besides the Sitwe and the Chabahar, Chabahar is another port uh, that India is developing near the Gwadar port. Chabahar is in Iran. Uh, so yeah, in, so although China is trying to build a string of pearls, India is in a very strong position here. Independently, also India has its assets because it's 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 near Indian territory. Plus, it is building uh, certain infrastructures around uh, in the neighborhood also. Plus, it has the support of other countries like United States, Japan, and Australia. So this is the whole string of pearls strategy. Then we have the. Belt and Road Initiative. I have uh, in the last lecture already shown you how the maritime road is is basically a reflection of the Chang'e's voyages during the Ming Dynasty period, during the fifth, early 15th century, even before Vasco da Gama and and Christopher Columbus sailed. Chang'e, you know, uh, shocked and awed Asian and African countries with the might of the Chinese Navy. So Xi Jinping wants to restore that that particular pride by connecting China to all the way to uh, Europe. Similarly, there is the the land route uh, by which uh, China is trying to connect. So there are several of them. So there is China, Mongolia, Russia. So Mongolia is here. So building a road connecting. Uh, China, Mongolia, and Russia, and also building pipelines of uh, which supply energy to China because now Russia is being isolated internationally and its supplies to Europe ha have decreased, and so Russia is trying to increase its supply to China under American pressure because of the Ukraine war, and even before that, uh, Europe was trying to reduce its energy dependence on Russia, and therefore now Russia is looking for new buyers, and China is one of the important. Buyers. Then there was this whole plan of building a Eurasian land bridge connecting China with Central Asia and from Central Asia to Russia and then into Europe, into Germany, from Poland to Germany. But uh, after the Ukraine war, this this project is looking uh, unfeasible. Then there is another one that is uh, basically connecting Central Asia with West Asia and from uh, Turkey going into. Europe. So this looks more feasible right now. Then there is the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which I have already mentioned in the string of pearls. 
this is not economically viable because Ch Pakistan is a declining economy and it is it does not have the capacity to generate resources in order to repay repay China and there is a lot of protest in Pakistan also because of the presence of the Chinese in, in, in Pakistan and so this is not looking very successful. Then there is also one concerning India that is Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, BCIM. Once, so India was a bit interested in this because it wanted Chinese money to be invested in India. But once this became part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and CPEC also is a part which, which infringes upon Indian territory, sovereign Indian territory in Gilgit Baltistan. So, uh, India has abandoned this particular project and, 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 and Bangladesh is also does not seem to be very interested. Okay, so, so, Belt and Road Initiative is, is not something unique, it is basically bringing together all the existing projects and trying to implement it in a huge scale using all the money that China has, all the foreign exchange reserves that China has and connecting that with uh, new banks, international banks uh, which would uh, basically loan money for these projects. Okay, so, this is basically a grand plan of Xi Jinping to establish alternative institutions to western institutions like World Bank, IMF and Asian Development Bank which are considered to be western institutions or, or Asian Development Bank led by Japan. China is developing its own uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank which is connected with One Belt One Road and also the BRICS Bank um, uh, as alternative uh, lending sources. Now, what is the reason that China is focusing so much on Belt and Road Initiative? Now, I have already mentioned that uh, China wants to build an alternative system. China considered itself to be to be the ruler of Tian Xia. Tian means heaven, Xia means under. So, all under heaven is supposed to be the domain of the Chinese emperor. So, so the center, the core of it is Chung Kuo, that is China. Then there are the tributaries, the, the countries that accept the greatness of China, accept the leadership of China. And then there are barbarians who oppose China, who do not accept the leadership of China. So the Chinese view is that, so there is China which is, which is basically the uh, middle kingdom, the representative of heaven, the sky. Then there are tributaries which accept like North Korea, Pakistan or any country which consider itself uh, uh, respected or honored to be part of uh, One Belt, One Road. And then there are barbarians like India or United States or Japan or, which do not accept the leadership of, of China. So that is the Chinese view. Now the historical view is China fell from that status of, of uh, Tianxia in, in the middle of the 19th century because the West overtook Western Japan, overtook China economically and technologically and therefore the uh, Middle Kingdom collapsed and then there was this century of humiliation. But under the Chinese Communist Party, China is rising again, focusing on economic development and as a result. China would re-emerge as the middle kingdom. Now there are three alternatives to this. Either it is going to be a G2 which has been proposed by many American uh, strategists also that China and America should come together instead of getting into conflict, they should work together and, uh, and manage the world affairs in a partnership. So China and US would be at the top and other countries would be below them. That, so that is the concept of G2. The other option is the Thucydides trap. So, America is the existing hegemon, China is the rising power. So, according to Thucydides, uh, uh, the uh, uh, existing hegemon is threatened by a rising power and so there is bound to be a war between them. So, this will lead to a war and whoever will be successful would be the new hegemon. This is known as the Thucydides trap. The other option is a Sinocentric order. So, America declines and collapses and China continues to grow until China decides on how the world should be controlled. The Chinese would decide the currency, the global currency, they will decide on uh, how money should be landed, what infrastructure to be built, so on and so forth. So, 
it will be a sinocentric world order, which which doesn't look to be feasible right now. It, it looks more in, in the second Sorry. option seems to be the more likely thing. Whether it will lead to a war or it will lead to a collapse of China, that is something to be seen. But for India, India has to be balanced because if China collapses, then uh, uh, India won't be looked at as an ally by the US. It, it could be looked at as a new threat. So the collapse of China could be a threat for India. Then of course, there is a regional influence. I won't have enough time to go into details. Uh, India, China wants to influence uh, neighboring countries where America is a dominant power in most of the places. It wants to replace America or say in Central Asia where Russia is dominant, it wants to replace Russia or in say South Asia, India is the dominant power. So it wants to replace the dominant power by itself. Okay, so most of these areas are dominated by the United States, whether it's East Asia, whether it's West Asia or Africa, they're all dominated by the United States. So China wants to replace the United States as the predominant power, while in Central Asia it is Russia and in South Asia it is India. Belt and Road Initiative is also important domestically for China because China's economic growth is slowing down. It needs uh, and, and its domestic consumption is in incre in increasing. Its exports have begun to decline, but its its domestic consumption has not increased. As a result, Belt and Road is is an opportunity for China to invest in in its own own uh, industry, but a steel, cement, and that can be used to build infrastructure, not just in China but also abroad, uh, and and it could also be used to develop the western region of China. The western region of China, that is Tibet and those areas, Xinjiang and all, they are very backward compared to the coastal areas, which are like developed countries, very advanced because of special economic zones and, and the foreign investment there, FDI there. So this is an employment and income generation project for the Chinese economy. Finally, it also brings political stability to, to China. So Xi Jinping, the paramount leader, he, he is trying to personalize the whole uh, party state military uh, leadership in China. He wants it to, to move away from the collective leadership idea of Tang Xiaoping into, into this uh, idea of Xi Jinping being, being the absolute unquestioned leader. In fact, he has amended the constitution a few times to include his own name inside the constitution. So this is a unique thing that there is a leader whose name is inside the constitution of, of a country. He has also ended the term limits. Uh, of the Chinese president, it used to be two terms. Now he has come to uh, uh, to power in in his third term, and there are some ideological issues. He has also used anti-corruption to eliminate all his rivals or the people who could stop him from personalizing power. So, but he believes that it will bring political stability to China, so that factions are ended, and there is only one person who is the leader of China who can lead China into into the 21st century as the new superpower. Thank you.